Hello and welcome to episode 12 of Crypto Combos. I took a little bit of a break recently, but I'm very happy to be back and I'm really excited for today's guest. Uh, today I have Dr. Patrick Byrne, CEO of Overstock.com and investigative journalist. Uh, some of you may know him from his website DeepCapture.com, which goes into the corruption in Wall Street and and basically the problems with regulatory capture. So he announced last year too that he'll be working with Counterparty to start his own crypto securities project and the, his own crypto stock market which will be very challenging to Wall Street and I'm sure there are a lot of hurdles involved in that too so we're going to be discussing that a little bit later on. Uh, so how are you doing today Patrick? Great Megan, good to, good to be looking at your face again. I think it's been uh... Since the beginning of last year in Arizona, we crossed paths at some Bitcoin conference. Yes, uh, actually, we spoke about a year ago at uh, Freedom Summit in Arizona, and that went really well. You were a keynote speaker there. Uh, very, very fascinating talk, and it was it was a great interview. So I'm really happy to get you back. I'm glad you could take time out of your busy schedule to talk with me. What an honor! I'm down here in uh, in Vegas for the CES show today, the big electronic show. Haven't been, haven't done this kind of thing for ten years. It's quite. Last time I was down in, in at the CEO is the big electronics convention of year. We were just a little tiny company trying to knock on people's doors and get somebody to listen to us. And now it's a, it's a, it's a lot more fun, sort of having a bit of throw weight. All right. So what are you looking forward to there? Oh well, we've just been doing some great brands and buying. Great deal. That's for my, my day job. You remember, is I run a dot com, a discount dot com called Overstock, and so that's what I have to spend some of my time on. Not always just this crypto stuff. <laughs> right on, right on. But the crypto stuff is really fun too. Um, so, and it's something that I, th I think really suits your personality. You, you, you're no stranger to controversies. So, I think Bitcoin is something that's extremely disruptive and very exciting. So, when did you first hear about Bitcoin? What were your initial thoughts about it? Well, it's kind of funny. It, about 25 years ago or more I was at Stanford doing graduate work at, which included work in cryptography and the mathematics that underlie cryptography. So when about four years ago I read an article on Bitcoin I immediately re understood that this was based on all that stuff that we used to study 25 years ago, the Byzantine generals problem, things like that, and computability theory. So NP hard problems. Stuff. So anyway we, uh, so I really had my eye on it for since about four years ago, and then it was November of 2013 that there was a, a Senate hearing, and some people went in from Treasury and stuff, and basically said, "Well, we don't like it, but we don't know how to make it illegal. It's not illegal." So, and once they said that, then I, last December of 2013 is when I started really coming up to speed, and we we turned it on on Overstock in early January. Thank you. Yeah, and Overstock was one of the very first retailers to take Bitcoin, and it was, it was a huge deal because not a lot of people were really jumping into it. A lot of people were really skeptical, and that's interesting that you were able to realize the disruptive nature of the technology early on. A lot of people kind of viewed Bitcoin as a currency and maybe didn't understand some of the other elements to it. So what, what other elements are very exciting to you? This is disruptive not just to finance and currency but also to journalism and to reputation systems and things like that. So what other things do you look forward to? Any centralized institutions. You know, there's a great, basically the choice in institutional design is or and, and those of us who are pro-free and pro-liberty who care about consensual acts, well it, you have a choice. Are your, is the system through which the, the value is exchanged, is it peer-to-peer, -peer, in which case you're going to have a problem of do you trust the person on the other side, or do you have a centralized institution where all don't need to know and trust each other, there's some centralized institution that we just have to learn to trust it. Well, centralized institutions are, have grown up, and the problem with centralized institutions, there are deep political problems with them they get captured, they get corrupted. So uh, what Bitcoin, what the crypto revolution does, it caught my eye, is it allows for the peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value in a trustless, a, a trustless peer-to-peer -peer way to exchange value, which is really kind of a historical breakthrough. I mean, there's never, that I can think of, there's never really been a, a well, there's not, never been a universal system of that, 
in all of human history, and there now is, and that's the blockchain. Right, and a lot of people kind of have problems with decentralized systems. A lot of times they'll say, oh, well, decentralization doesn't scale. But when you have these highly centralized institutions, you have these problems like regulatory capture, and you can't really trust them either. And do you think the problems with centralized systems versus the problems with decentralized systems are just far greater? Yes, in general. I mean, you've got to depend. The, the, it also, also depends on the good being discussed. But uh, I'd probably want centralized control of nuclear weapons, for example. I wouldn't want that to be centralized. But uh, so I, I do think that centralized, you always have to ask compared to what? It's the old Henny, Henny Youngman line. Remember that? Henny Youngman was an old Bush Belt comedian, and his joke was, I guy said to me the other day, how's your wife? I said, compared to what? You know, a lot of people, when they talk about society, they forget to ask, compared to what? Well. Uh, there are some drawbacks to decentralized institutions. Basically, they in, uh, involve trust. But with, in fact, there was a guy I quote, Francis Fukuyama, who's book Trust. Uh, its whole theory was that the West and Japan were so developed so much more quickly than China ever would, because we had gotten used to having centralized institutions of trust. But in some societies like China, and Italy, and such. Everything's family-based, and you never get beyond family-based. So it was a silly, I mean, I argue that this was a silly book, but the deep, the deep uh, because he didn't understand there are real problems with centralized institutions as well. But they, uh, and it has to do with, it has to do with corruption of various kinds. Right. You see a lot of corruption in these industries, and especially, I wanted to kind of talk about journalism for a while, too, because you've definitely been a victim of just really bad hit pieces and things like that. Some of the stuff I've read uh, by these journalists about you is just so outrageous, and a lot of people say, well, there is this kind of conspiracy, you know, with the banks and with the media and, and the government and things like that. You know, the state has used them as a mouthpiece for their agenda in a lot of ways. And a lot of people maybe don't realize that or they try to downplay it, but you were a very, you saw direct, basically direct uh, evidence of this corruption. And uh, you documented it very well. And what do you think, how can blockchain technology decentralize journalism and kind well, of get power back to citizen journalists? It's a lot loaded, a lot loaded into that question. First I'll say I don't, thank you for noticing, I don't it's been years. That was all about ten years ago. There were a lot of hit pieces on me from from journalists who, if you looked into them, a handful of journalists, half a dozen journalists, who were very clear. If you looked into, there seemed to be some deep ties between these journalists, Bethany McLean, Joe Nocera, Herb Greenberg, Roddy Boyd, these journalists, and a and some real concentrated evil power on Wall Street. Bethany McLean does nothing but talk Goldman Sachs's book. You know, you look at any article. You look at any, there's a small set of hedge funds that any company they attack, you could always count on accompanying articles from this set of journalists. And there are, there are reasons to think that at least some of them received actual bribes. Uh, I never saw myself as a victim. I always consoled myself with that great line of Jonathan Swift. He said, when a true genius appears in this world, we'll know him by one sign. And that is all the dunces are in confederacy against him. To me, it was just... It's a sign that I was right, but all the dunces, the, these dunce journalists, the same half dozen, were very clearly tied to the bad guys on Wall Street were, were slinging this mud at me. Um, how, can, how can journalism be disrupted? Uh, you know, journalism is another centralized institution. It, you can't, if everyone just wrote, their own, just wrote their own blogs, I mean, the theory would be that, well, no one would, if somebody goes on and wants to read the news, they won't know who to trust. There's also, also the problem of payments, but they won't know what to trust. So we need some centralized institution which puts its imprimatur on you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post or Associated Press that is saying this piece of writing is true and we're putting our reputation behind it. So it's a, it is the paradigm of the centralized institution and everybody is supposed to trust that. I imagine some of what journalism reports on can be... I mean, some of what journalism is doing is an interpretation. It's just reporting facts. And that can be facts that can be documented in the blockchain. Now, why don't I turn it over to you? I've got the, the sense that you have a more... Def one, one way that crypto can help journalism is to allow for micropayments, which would allow people to write blogs and make it very easy to get, hey, give me 20-cent tip and, and, and so forth. Micropayments would really 
to really obviate the need for those centralized institutions. Oops. Lost there for a second. Um, yeah, it's something. We got your back. <laughs> All right, but yeah, it's something that World Crypto Network has been working on too. Is you know trying to bring back the citizen journalist. And so my my opinion of journalism is, I, I don't really believe that journalists exist. I believe there are a lot of propagandists, and I don't even refer to myself as a journalist. I'm a writer. I do a lot of opinion pieces that are fact based, but there's still a lot of opinion. In you know in, injected with it, and I make no claims that I'm a journalist. I do believe that journalism should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And you see, you still see a lot of that happening, and I think you're even seeing it happening within the Bitcoin space. Something that you're seeing a lot of is scams and frauds because it's new. And even in the early days of the internet, in the early days of anything, scammers will flock to it and try to corrupt it and try to you know basically pursue their own goals and rip a bunch of people off and I think now is a good time to be calling out those people and that's what I like about World Crypto Network for example is they're going after some of these frauds and exposing them and attacking them and I think that in a way is, is good journalism um, but again I do take issue with the term journalism itself and as far as micropayments that's a great that's a really a great thing because it's very difficult especially if you do have a traditional journalist mindset to get into some of these larger media organizations and try to put forth a more balanced perspective on things if you are doing true journalism it's supposed to be less biased it's not supposed to be forming an agenda for someone else and yet that's what you seen a lot of times. So I really want to see journalism decentralized, kind of power back to the people, I guess you could say. And uh, yeah, again, I think this is a situation where the problems with centralization are greater than the problems with decentralization, especially in the age of the internet, where it is easy to verify facts. And with a blockchain, it would be even easier to verify those facts. Yes, that's a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, in particular, I think that what it the, the micropayments uh, thing is big because if you think of the basic business model of the New York Times, it's you know you're not you don't really have the, these different writers are coming on just to use as neutral term as possible. They're coming on and writing, but while you read their stuff and are willing to pay a buck a day or something to read their stuff versus everybody else's, is because it's getting that seal of approval. But of that dollar you're paying for the seal of approval, how much is that journalist getting? The journalist is getting a hundredth of a penny uh, who wrote the stuff that you actually read today. And everything else is going to the overhead. Well, what if we just keep, if you just have writers, so to speak, you have a reputation effect that starts, you know, so yeah, some, some writers are going to be bad journalists and lie and not get their facts right and such. Others are going to be good. You make it very easy to make, you know, the micropayments of a few cents of a few cents to read an article, somebody. So I, you know, I read hundreds of articles a week. I'm, I'm sure I would click the pay for three cents, and you solve all these different problems that you know the people have not really been able to make the subscription model work in the internet age. There's a few people whose content is so good, like Wall Street Journal or The Economist, they do, but most of them are giving it away and getting charging advertising or something. You could, you can change, you can disrupt that whole industry and say. Those writers no longer need, it's like musicians no longer need record companies. Well, the writers at the Washington Post no longer need the Washington Post. They can just be writing their stuff, probably making far more money, getting, and, you, and, and even if you're only paying two or three cents per article, they're individually making far more money. Why you have this middleman, this huge middleman that everybody's paying for? Yes, and you're very much beholden to the opinions of the advertisers on your site, too. I mean, Gawker can't write a piece criticizing their advertisers. They recently had a, a bit of a controversy with that, even. Tell me I didn't know that. Tell me about that. Yeah, so... Uh, so Gawker is, is kind of known for really going after uh, certain people in certain industries and I don't really agree with their tactics, I don't really agree with a lot of what they write in general, but there have been problems with their advertisers, I'll have to look up the exact one to be sure, but um, 
but yeah, they were having problems with with some of their advertisers, but they they weren't allowed to criticize those advertisers basically. And you see that with with any organization that relies on advertisements. I mean, I you know I don't I don't want any sponsors for my YouTube show, for example, because then you know if something if a controversy comes up with that sponsor, then you know I I'm in this bad position where you know at my urge as as someone who's looking for truth would be to criticize them but I'm not able to do that my hands are kind of tied because it's tied to your source of revenue whereas peer-to-peer -peer payment systems allow you to just go to the source the people are directly supporting you and your work and you're not beholden to anyone else's opinion so yes yeah, so what you said about micropayments is spot-on and it, it what it does I think is it allows people to actively pursue the truth really you know really really go for it and not be held back by uh, you know the opinions of their advertisers or things like that so it's still kind of getting a slow start I think and I uh, you know it but it's built in with Bitcoin you know it, it's already made very easy to do and I even know of people who are putting up sites you know where it's a paywall similar to uh, you know, Wall, Wall Street Journal or some of these other things, they have these, you know, articles that you need to go through a paywall to get to. You put a tiny amount in and you can get through. Um, they're doing that with Bitcoin, which is even easier than some of the tradition, traditional paywalls they've seen. I'm not a huge fan of paywalls myself, but I do see the value in that, especially, again, with micro-tipping, with these very small amounts. These very tiny amounts can add up and can be very significant for an individual who may be pursuing writing as a hobby or you know maybe they're not able to make enough just yet as a writer so they're pursuing it as a hobby and it can kind of supplement them and you know help push them in that direction uh, and hopefully we do see it succeed on a larger scale um, I wanted to kind of talk about let's see I wanted to kind of talk about regulations because this is something that you've had a lot of experience with and a lot of uh, struggles with and if you if you believe in the state if you're a minarchist or you know small libertarian you know the state's role should be to prevent fraud and what we're seeing in bitcoin is still a lot of fraud and a lot of scams so there are a lot of calls for regulators to come in and regulate the space to protect people you know in the name of protecting people have you have, are you familiar with some of the proposed regulations like the ones coming out of new york I'm familiar with them in, vaguely, but I mean, at a high level. Why don't you go ahead and, and uh, refresh me on anything you want to talk about specifically? Well, they're wanting to regulate the space uh, in accordance with the kind of anti-money laundering laws that are already set in place. And a lot of people think that they're overbearing, that they could stifle innovation. I, I tend to kind of fall on that side of things. I already think that some of the anti-money laundering laws are a little bit too strict and that they usually target smaller people. They're not really targeting, uh, you know, larger criminals, uh, you know, the larger banks. Like the Bank of New York, who, who did billions of dollars for Russian organized crime, and I think I've paid a $4 billion. People forget, these massive, well-known New York banks have gotten dinged for laundering money for years for organized crime. Now, organized crime, people, it, organized, there's very fuzzy boundaries between the swanky Wall Street financial system that you, that, you, know, you know and you see advertising on the NFL, and organized crime. And that's the, there's all kinds of deep links between them. And back in New York, and Goldman Sachs being among them. Right, or someone like HSBC who laundered millions of dollars to Mexican drug cartels, resulting in the deaths of we don't even know how many thousands of people no from, from, from no cartel no violence. Right. I mean, well, well, you know, if they really want to stop money laundering, they can stop about 95 percent of it, I think, overnight, which is the legalized consensual act between adults. You know, it's, I think you, you, you stop all the money, you take the money out of the system if you just legalize all consensual acts between adults. You know, you're still going to have gun runners who are who are laundering, have to launder money, I suppose. But pretty much, I think just about all the other money gets taken out of the money laundering system, doesn't it? If you legalized, if you re-legalized acts, consensual acts between adults. Right. Well, yeah, and a lot of this cartel violence is a direct result of the drug war and all of this prohibition that you see. And it's it's really disturbing. It's even more disturbing when you realize that there are banks financing these people and not not receiving any penalties for it. None of these executives went to jail. It was it was very clear too. It was very 
I mean, all of the evidence is out there, and it was just kind of like, oh, well, nothing's really going to happen. Well, and they, yet, are, they have their own regulators on speed dial. They have their own prosecutors on speed dial. Actually, I think the DOJ is is good. I think the SEC is a, is a towel void for the oligarchy. We've, we've, but this is how we, where the public's going to die. Can I continue on this theme for a moment, or I don't want to get too... You know, this is our founding fathers understood that this was the great, this was the rock on which founded all democracies before us. They set up the concept, they were great students of classical history. They understood all these different ways democracies fail. And, the, and they set up the constitution to address those ways. The basic ways are if democracy is too direct, you end up with demagogues swaying the masses and demagogues turn into tyrants. And if you make, if you try to balance that by making democracy indirect, it's senators, you end up with an aristocracy and tyrants and whatever you, so they set up the constitution to try to balance these things. And the one thing that they knew they hadn't gotten, and they said this in Federalist Paper Number 10, I think that was Hamilton, said basically, I forget the wording, but it was the, uh, the one problem that we're not confident we've solved is the problem of special interests, or what they call factions. And they, they had this very weak argument that by splintering up power and decision making across into so many places across the government, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't pay for anyone to actually try to, it would be impossible to capture. However, even uh, in Federalist Paper number 10, they, they say that's really kind of the one answer we don't have confidence in. So that's, and it's just happened, it's happened here. We, we have a republic that's well on its way to being an oligarchy. And the oligarchy, doing what oligarchies always do, they leverage themselves up, crash, and then bail themselves out on our credit cards. That's all that's happening. And it's and there's uh, economists like Simon Johnson at MIT, formerly IMF chief economist, has been making this point. So this is not some you know this is a pattern that we can see it very easily in other places, but we just have trouble seeing it in ourselves. So uh, so and, and the banking system is a part of that. The banking system serves that oligarchy. So yeah, they can break the law shamelessly. You know, back in 20 years ago, 23 years ago, the SNL crisis, thousand people went to prison. You know, and it was far smaller. This is the first William Black, this great law professor in, in uh, Missouri, says this is the first uh, immaculate, you know, financial scandal. It's like no one's gone to prison, and yet trillions of it's cost the country trillions. Right, and it, it's a it's a terrifying thing, and prohibition is such a cause of it. I kind of dropped out for a second, so I missed kind of the a little bit of what you're saying there but uh, but yeah it's it's this terrible thing and I, I wanted to go to this quote I, I found this interesting quote that you said in Wired magazine and it said someday either zombies walk the earth or something close to it Bitcoin is the solution so my question is that someday actually today and how can Bitcoin how is Bitcoin the solution to that well I should say today I, uh, a couple points I'll address the, uh, the zombies walk the earth is a metaphor, and that refers to I don't know I don't believe at all in this recovery. This eco economy, this recovery is all been created by the Federal Reserve driving up the stock market, asset prices for people who's who make eighty thousand dollars a year, but have seen their four hundred one k go from three hundred to four hundred thousand, think of themselves as making one hundred eighty thousand that year, and they got to spend like that, and that's driving I think about seven percent of the economy. It's just that layer of foam, just as it was in 2007. So I don't believe in this recovery. Uh, do I? So, and I think when it cracks, all we've done is we've put off the problems. And the problems are much deeper than Barack Obama or George Bush. The problems go back decades. Uh, when it cracks, we're going to want a form of to communicate, a form of communication. And that's what money is in one perspective. It's a way that we can communicate with each other about value and scarcity. Prices are information about value and scarcity. Uh, we want, so far, the system we use to communicate, used to, when it was on gold, we had something that couldn't be gained. But as long as there's a Federal Reserve and a fractional reserve banking system, ultimately the system by which we communicate is owned by other people who can distort our messages to each other. We're going to want a way to communicate with a with money that the mandarins cannot just whisk into existence, and that would be. Now I say Bitcoin. I said Bitcoin in that article, but the truth is I've emphasized many times my commitment is not to Bitcoin itself; it's to crypto. 
because I don't know what currency wins. And it's not just about the currencies. I but I don't know which one wins. It may not be Bitcoin. And my commitment is the crypto is the real revolution. Right, right. And what, I, what I've been doing lately, I, I do use Bitcoin synonymously for blockchain technology, but I do agree in com with competing currencies and things like that. And I, my day job is at, a, at Roberts & Roberts, which is a precious metals brokerage. And something that you see a lot of is manipulation with paper contracts and things like that. This is kind of going to lead into a question that I was asked on Twitter today um, from a friend, uh, named Jesper, and a lot of people say, oh, well, the, this paper contract stuff, oh, it's, it's mythical, but this is actually a real thing that happens. Um, my boss actually caught them in the act of it. He, this was several years ago. He was, uh, he took a call from a client who was trying to get physical delivery of his silver contracts, and he was calling the trader who was responsible for the contracts, trying to get those released, and he was like, oh, I have to get them released from multiple contracts. And and he didn't get it. He kept saying, "Wait, what's that? What's that?" He tried to get it recorded, didn't quite get it. But this is this happens all the time. There's a lot of manipulation. And uh, so Jesper from from Twitter asks, he's asking about the D DTCC and the lack of ownership of stocks in the current market. So could you talk a bit about that and how blockchain tech can provide a kind of proof of ownership of stocks? It's going to kind of go into crypto securities and right. Stuff. Well, if you think you own stock in the stock market, you're wrong. If you have an E-Trade account, any of your viewers, or any any brokerage account, and you think you have, say, 100 shares of IBM in it, you don't. You don't have any property rights in any stock. And I'm not just referring to the fact that it's not paper. I'm referring to the fact that legally you don't have property rights. We have a very arcane and complex system in the country that was adopted 40 years ago, centering on a corporation you've probably never heard of, or most people have never heard of, the DTCC which is, I think, the heart of darkness on Wall Street. It's the heart of the evil. It's the settlement system. And without getting into all the technical details, what happens is there's actually, you, what you think you have a property right in, that, that share of IBM stock, you don't. You have, an, you have a contractual right against the brokerage house, which has a contractual right maybe against a, another brokerage house, which has a contractual right against the DTCC which has a subsidiary which has the actual property rights. There's these daisy chains of property rights, of, of contractual rights. So you don't own, and the system is set up explicitly. It's written, you know, it's written in the fine print. If you go into your brokerage statement and stuff, if, uh, if your brokerage is telling you you own 100 shares, but it turns out someday that they've been, you know, that they really have 1,000 shares on deposit and they, that they actually, and they have, they're telling their customers that they own 5,000 shares. Everyone gets cut back peri passu. And you'll find out you don't have 100 shares, you have 20 shares. The system is set up with those triggers in it because people cheat. And there's, and there's absolutely no question, there's huge amounts of slop in the system. If in the event of a financial collapse, everyone's going to find out you own about a fifth of what you think you own in the system. Who knows what the number is? They won't, they won't really disclose the data between what people are being told they own and what they do. So the point is all that goes away with the blockchain. When if we could have crypto securities, we would actually have a property right in a coin, in a coin that's like a share of stock in a company, but there's only one coin, there's not duplication, there's not fractional reserve banking without reserve requirements, which is really what our broker system is. You know, all this high frequency trading, 70% of the activity in the market today, just computer algorithms buying and selling to each other. There's no actual stock underlying any of that. A huge amount of the volume you're seeing in the market is is just one computer in one pocket sending false signals to a computer in the other pocket. There's there's no actual so there's so much fraud that the, the real signal is lost. Anyway, in a crypto security stock market, there isn't any of that. There isn't a room for the high frequency you know, gerbils. There's not a room there. Uh, there's not a room for the DTCC that is a central counterparty clearing system and everybody hooks up to it and it, it keeps the books and everybody trusts it. You don't have to, and in my view, the DTCC is very closely linked to organized crime. Uh, and that's what deep capture explores. One of the areas it explores is how organized crime seems to be involved in the settlement system. Uh, you take all that away from them. You get a peer-to-peer -peer settlement system based on cryptography where, there's, where trust is not an issue. You, know, you couldn't have 2,000 brokers in America all trading with each other directly 
because you wouldn't know who to trust. And maybe this brokerage in Iowa is cheating on its books and they're, they're not going to deliver tomorrow. So we can't all trust each other in these brokerages, so we have to have a central counterparty clearing at DTCC. But you go to peer to peer, where our brokerages can talk directly to each other, or even just we as individuals at the retail level can talk directly to each other, buy and sell, and the settlement is secure. It's it's a revo it's a world historic revolutionary innovation. Absolutely. So how is how is that coming along? How is the the crypto securities that you're working on coming along? I, I know you mentioned you're partnering with Counterparty. What kind of hurdles have you faced? Well, we have had sort of a loose uh, alliance with Counterparty. We we're not you know uh, we're we're open to other people. In fact, we are talking to other people. But we like we like Counterparty, but we like some other people too. We've uh, we've made some interesting investments. We're building some technology, and in the first half of this year, I believe we'll have some quite exciting announcements. All right, awesome. I definitely look forward to that. About, uh, the, you... about the technology we've built and the applications it could have for the world. We've really gotten some very sharp Wall Street guys to join the company. I mean, it's costing some money, but we've got a bunch of people that we've married to a bunch of developers, and they're working in a special war room, and they're putting together some technology that I think is pretty worth shaping. And it's very, it's really awesome because you're building systems that are harder to cheat. That you know, you you can't cheat as easily as the current systems. And I I like, I want to see more innovations in reputation systems too. I think we're we're also seeing that with Bitcoin. Um, there are things like the Web of Trust, and there are some of these other uh, projects that are being started where you know you have uh, your reputation linked to a Bitcoin address, and you can see you know whether or not this person is following through on their trades, whether you you know, every, everything's public and open, and it, again, there are drawbacks to that. But it's a really interesting study, and I think uh, you know it, it's definitely a worthwhile experiment to be doing. Um, I do want to, you know, it looks like we have some good questions here. Uh, I'm gonna start, let's start taking some questions. Uh, let's see, Dale is watching. Hey, Dale. To, it's always good to see Dale. So I okay, this is a good one from Dale. She asks, "Do you think the initial growth of Bitcoin is purely a mirror of fraudulent business? What's needed to create human networks that interact like the blockchain?" Good question. Well, it does seem that a disproportionate amount of the early activity in Bitcoin was some some bad players, uh, and I I think people are bad players if they're selling ecstasy and on the internet and cocaine, whether or not. You know, uh, I think those are bad players. On the other hand, for all the news stories about it, remember that the U.S. dollars are used by people who sell cocaine and bazookas, and nobody writes stories about, oh my God, the U.S. dollar must be must be outlawed because you know bad guys are using it. Yeah, bad guys use money. Um, I think that well, what what has to happen is that more. It's a economists call it a network effect. There's a network effect to be had. Think of it as the first person who owned a fax machine. What was that fax machine worth? Well, it was worth zero because there was no one you could send a fax to. So some guy on the other side of the world gets a fax machine. Well, now my fax machine is marginally more useful. If I happen to want to send a fax to that person, I can. It's a little bit more useful. But when there's two or three people, now how many connections are there? Six possible. Anyway, the number of possible connections goes up with the square of the number of participants. And that's called an increasing return to scale or network effect. Uh, it's going to be the same with crypto. So we started we started accepting it. I think Newegg and a few other, Fish TV, a few other people did after us. Uh, it's like the early days of eBay. Why go to eBay if there was only one person selling something on eBay? But as more people started coming in and buying and selling, the value of the platform grew exponentially. Uh, and I expect the same thing here. We'll, we're going to start giving employees the ability to take their bonus in Bitcoin. And maybe we'll pay 102% of a normal bonus to incentivize them, let them, let them take it in Bitcoin. Uh, we're going to start letting our suppliers take it. Uh, and as we build these different systems out, then, and as other companies do the same, gradually our customers can be you know, you start reaching that, that tipping point, like I was describing with the fax machines, where it just takes off for itself. I think it starts happening at about 1, 2, 4 percent myself. I think if we can get crypto to being, right now crypto is about 15 basis points. That's 
15 hundredths of 1% of transactions on our site, I think, is, is the number now. Uh, when that gets to 1% or 2%, and as long as we're doing our part at bringing different people into the ecosystem, and others are doing it as well, it starts reaching 2 4%, suddenly the magic happens. But we gotta, we got to get it to that 1 2 or 4% ourselves. Right, and to also maybe add on to Dale's uh, question, uh, you know, as a response, I think there definitely needs to be a mindset change. A lot of people are rushing to Bitcoin because they see quick and easy money to be made, and while it is a currency, it's so many other things, and we have to reevaluate the way we trust people and the way we think of human relationships, too, before we can maybe get to that point. Hmm, how do you mean? Um, as far as... Placing standards for uh, self, you know, I wouldn't say uh, it was, it's more self-imposed standards of human behavior. You know how you know not cheating people. You know, obviously greed is always a concern. You have kind of that uh, you know creative destruction element of capitalism involved, and there, there's a lot of money to be made. But I think as you know, you have to kind of maybe self-regulate more. You know, think of things in more long-term goals instead of just. You know, how, how can I make money now and how can I make it fast? What about the greater implications of the technology? You know, how can we build systems where trust is, uh, you know, able to be seen and it's more transparent? So, uh, I mean, yeah, a bit of a mindset away from the older paradigm of, you know, just rushing in and making quick and easy money and then getting out of something. Uh, I think we're going to deal with that problem for a while. Um, but it's something I think we can see changing too, and and in journalism too. Again, uh, the potential for journalism to, you know, be more truth fo focused and less agenda focused too. I hope to see a lot more of that, and hopefully that will be an influencing factor. Um, let's see. So from this your, is kind. Of, from oh, your go lips ahead. to God, from your lips to God, dear Megan. <laughs> Let's see, so another one from Dale. This is kind of, we, we, you were kind of talking about the dark net there for a second. So form, forms of communication, also social networks. What do you think about social networks on the dark net? Well, the advantage of, of, the, of it being on the dark net being that uh, it wouldn't be possible for the black helicopter people to tap into it or to do the to analyze it, or what's the advantage of it being on the dark net? Yeah, there's not much more to that question. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I guess this would kind of play into trust systems on the dark net, uh, so let's see, social networks on the dark net. Uh, one, one feature of the Silk Road, for example, was reputation. You, ha you were able to see or a rating system that was fairly accurate. You were able to see who was trustworthy, even if you disagree with maybe some of the activity that was going on there, some of the drug dealing and things like that. You still were able to vet the people you were getting those services from. Uh, well, so maybe that's what, that's what she's uh, talking about. Well, I think that is a, a great thing. People, you know, this whole modern question of, well, don't you believe in regulation? First of all, most, uh, you know, don't you want more regulation? Most people who say that don't understand that the first problem with Wall Street isn't the lack of regulation, it's the lack of the, re the regulators are in the pocket of the bad guys. So, it does, you know, you've got the sheriff working for the local drug dealer. It doesn't really matter what the rules are. The problem is you've got the captures. So, that, so before you even get to the question of more regulation and less regulation, there's that. As far as when people talk about regulation, they often forget that there's lots of ways to regulate. There's lots of ways to regulate a restaurant. There's lots of ways to, you know, you can have the state coming in and doing it, or you can have its reputation doing it. You can have its customers can regulate the restaurant. They're regulating the restaurant by if they're not getting good meals and not getting good value for their money, they're able to put it up on Yelp and leave and 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 uh, and not go back. And other people, so the reputation can regulate the restaurant. So you want anything that can. Anything that can enhance the reputation effect in a private market is that I can think of is good because the more of that kind of regulation you have, which is peer-to-peer -peer and consensual, uh, the less of the overbearing authoritarian regulation you need, which has all kinds of potential problems, that it can be bought off, that it can be captured, that it can be hijacked by some competitors and turned against other competitors. So there's all those problems with the centralized regulation. If you go to the marketplace, 
a properly functioning marketplace, the participants can regulate each other's behavior. Now, a lot of that goes out the window when we talk about financial instruments because a financial the financial industry is a natural uh, honey honey pot for fraudsters. Because it's in the nature of every financial business to say, you give me something today, some money today, and I'll do something for you in the future. I'll fix your windshield if the car hits it. I'll pay your wife a death benefit if you die, things like that. So this nature of you give me some money today, I'll do something for you in the future is very attractive for fraudsters. So the financial industry draws more than its share uh, of, of crooks. So I think there is a role. Absolutely, there's a role for the state. But the more you can move that role into something, you know, I, I trust that that function to be fulfilled more completely by a war in a world where there are systems of tracking reputation and exposing reputation, and people have incentives for good behavior. Than I do necessarily in a world where it's all being overseen by some SEC goons who are simultaneously looking for jobs with the crooks that are supposed to be, you know, regulating today. Right, and Dale's follow-up question is good too. Property rights in a coin. There aren't any smart contracts, though. If that were included in crypto trade, how would that alter fraudulent behavior in the crypto world? Um, well, I'm a big fan of the smart contract and the oracles. You heard about how all this is going to work. Who's work? Who's the farthest advanced in this stuff now? Can you say in the smart contracts? You know, I'm not sure. Probably the best, the person who knows the most about it that I've talked to is Pamela Morgan of Empowered Law. She she sets up smart contracts uh, and does corporate governance, and uh, so I know she's extremely knowledgeable about it. And uh, so she she's who I go to for for a lot of those questions. So I, I highly recommend uh, you know getting in touch with her even. So Pamela is is an expert on that. And in fact, I I'll have to. I'll have to send you one of her videos too. She's done some great presentations, so I, I would definitely go to her. Uh, I just love the name Empowered Law because that yes. it. you have a smart. You know, normally how it works is if I'm growing oranges in Florida and I've got to worry about, hey, there may be a frost once every five years that wipes out my crop. I'm going to go and buy a derivative contract, let's say from you, that that says, okay, four to five years I'm paying you something, but one out of five years when there's a frost that I'm getting paid something that sort of balances out the risk for me. I'm hedging my risk. Well, we have to work through brokers, and the brokers have contracts. And if people don't perform, there's lawsuits and arguments about what was in the paper and the contract, and it goes to judges. And contract, there's a great book called The Death of Contract, how in the last 100 years the progressive movement really stripped out the ability of people to form a lots of types of contracts with each other. And there's a legal system that has to intermediate it all. What if instead we can have something in the blockchain, a contract, a pair of transparent code that's been developed open source over time, so it's probably the Darwinian selection over some years, the perfect contract will evolve, and it wakes up on the appointed day, it checks with some oracle, was there a frost or not, and if there was, it sends me some coins, and if there wasn't, it sends you some coins. That situation suddenly there's no reason to have lawyers. You don't need lawyers. You don't need judges checking the lawyers' work. You don't need brokers. You don't need a legal system. All these functions that the state performs, we will be reminded when that comes that these didn't come down from on high. These aren't you know, from God or something. These are just institutions we set up to achieve the end that I just described. And we can achieve that end far, in a far less costly manner through eventually as they develop smart contracts and so suddenly there's a huge layer of society that isn't needed and you know what it's it's the it's Shakespeare said first it's 12 words right that, that's the whole legal system gets disintermediated not the whole legal system but a big chunk of the legal system will get disintermediated by smart contracts and again, it's great. There's no one, no one to send a subpoena to. There's no one. You don't. I didn't even have to know who you are, and we can enter these deals. And and there's no. Now the the government isn't going to go down quietly. They're, they're going to be like a buggy whip manufacturer who's trying to outlaw automobiles or a taxi car company trying to outlaw Uber. You know, they're going. They're they're seeing their entire business model disrupted, and so uh, they will. They won't go quietly. That's for sure. Um, thank you, Dale. I'm going to take a question. Jeffrey Tucker has a question. Hey, Jeffrey, thanks for watching. 
Uh, let's see, he said, the headlines today are about how central banks and governments around the world are freaking out about falling prices and everything. You've specialized in getting great stuff to people at low prices. What is your opinion about falling prices in general? Well, I think, fa yeah, I, I think falling prices, uh, you know, the, not, the 20th century, the defenders of the central bank, the Federal Reserve, want to point out, well, yes, the dollar lost 98% of its value, but it was a good century. Look at how far humanity progressed. Well, the 19th century was even better, and we had slight deflation throughout the century. Uh, economists really worry about deflation. I, like, it's, uh, it's taboo. It's a taboo subject to discuss with some economists of my association. Uh, I think that it's good when your money can go farther. I think that, you know, that's good. What, what they think happens is other aspects of the system log jam. I'm not sure that's true. I think that this may be a myth that's been handed down. It's sort of the obfuscating ideology that goes with having a system of central banking, fractional reserve banking, federal reserve. Uh, I think that it's just everyone sort of gets indoctrinated early on in the economics professor that, the profession that there's some, we all have to avoid deflation. Oh, you never want to get to deflation. Uh, that is somehow tied with with depression, and I think that that's all quite questionable. And in a perfect world, you would have stable. Maybe you do have stable, stable or falling prices. I don't know. I just don't buy the the arguments of the people who sort of say out of the gate without without argument. That, oh no, we have to avoid a world of of uh, deflation. Well, and it's become lately a criticism of Bitcoin because the price has fallen so low and some people have kind of lost confidence. But at the same time, you are seeing more stability than we've seen in a very long time, which was the previous criticism of there's too much volatility in the price of Bitcoin. Why would I want to take that risk? Well, now we see a lower price and a little more stability, and I see that as actually a good thing. What, what's your opinion on the kind of lower I price? I, well, I don't care about the price I'm, at all. I care about the, uh, it as the medium of exchange, the technology, and all these things it can do. Uh, the uh, absolute volatility was what was scaring people off. And every time there, I was tracking this last year, and every time there was big volatility, heard all these stories about it, uh, and it just gave them something to convince about. But I, I'm happy. I, I'm I'm really quite agnostic about the price of the future price of Bitcoin, I don't speak of it in those terms, but something I am is an un, is a is a good thing is that volatility has become much more reasonable. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's less about the price and for me more about the potential and the other elements, you know, outside of the currency function of Bitcoin. Uh, so we have a good question from Adela Toulon Forster. Hey Adela Good to see you again. Uh, let's see. Does Mr. Burns see a future where Overstock is accepting other kinds of currency as payment? Accepting Bitcoin was a great risk for the company, but so important as per his fax machine analogy. Well, first, she can call me Patrick, as God never hasn't been a Mr. Burns in my family ever. Uh, uh, yeah, well, we're integrated with Coinbase, and Coinbase, it's really just going to be up to them. When they think another currency has reached a critical mass, and they want to accept it, they'll integrate with it, and then it will be live on our site as soon as they do. Awesome. Uh, let's see, got a few more. We, we, kind, of, we kind of answered this one here uh, a little bit earlier um, from Dale. Oh, wait, no, this is actually, no, this is from Tim. Okay, circling back to, hey, Tim, uh, circling back to blockchain securities, trading systems, and beyond, the technical and development processes, do you see regulatory hurdles as well? Um, so we were kind of talking about this uh, a little bit earlier. Um, any specific regulatory hurdles you've faced? Um... Well, we are working with the regulators uh, as I speak. And I have found that it's quite odd because for a decade I've been arguably the most outspoken critic of some of the groups in Washington. But I've had some very productive conversations in the last couple of few months. And they seem to be, uh, I have to give them high marks so far. They seem to, the attitude they are projecting to me is we are not going to dig in our heels and try to stop this. We want to see it develop so that it meets our needs, the know your customer, anti-money laundering kind of stuff. But we're not going to try to stop it. We, they seem like they want to be an adult partner, so to speak, in as, as, we, def, as we build the technology. We want it to meet, I don't want to pick a fight. It doesn't need to be picked. 
and if the SEC needs something done a certain way, so uh, you know they then you know there's no reason we're, as long as it's ethical and such, we'll build the technology so it matches you know what they think a well-regulated uh, capital market needs. And so far, I'm kind of pleasantly surprised. I got to say, really, with the CFTC, I had some. I don't want to say too much, but the CFTC, uh, Commodities and Future Trading Commission, is has some adult people in it at the top, and they we had a productive conversation. I think you kind of were seeing a similar thing in Canada. I don't know if you saw Andreas Antonopoulos' talk in front of the Canadian Senate, um, but they seem to be very open to the idea of maybe you know backing off uh, and kind of seeing the technology develop. So hopefully we'll see you know we'll see kind of a mature approach, like you said. Um, yeah, there is some, there is some hang up. At, well, I'll put it this way: I have had conversations with Washington. Where they are the equivalent of a of a buggy whip manufacturer talking about how the handle on the buggy whip. Well, we have these rules about how the handle has to be shaped of the buggy whip, and we're selling, we're building a car, and we keep having to tell them, look, these rules don't apply. This doesn't have, you know, this the, the rules that you have written have been to apply to a system of centralized settlement, and. We're doing something that that doesn't that stuff doesn't even apply to. There's no way to follow your rules because it's like describing the rules on how the buggy hip, buggy whip handle should be. So there's some of that going on, but so far I would say it's been productive conversations. Right on. And Tim, as a follow-up, uh, perhaps by regulatory hurdles, I mean the protection captured regulators seem to provide to hide the the fraud of large financial institutions. Well. That will be, uh, I think that the crypto revolution uh, suffocates them. I think the financial institutions, which are part of their business model, is is fractional reserve banking without a reserve requirement. It's ripping off the public. In one way or another, it's ripping off the public. High-frequency trading, this whole algorithmic trading you hear about. Michael Lewis did a really good book, Flash Boys, on this. But I've been following it since about 2009. It's... it's uh, it's Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, called it the rats in the granary of civilization. They add no value. They add no value. They say that they add value because they're bringing all this liquidity to the market and price discovery. First of all, there was a Journal of Finance article a couple of years ago showing that American capital markets reached adequate liquidity, beyond which new liquidity has not aided price discovery, sometime in the late 60s. So everything since the late 60s has, uh, in terms of liquidity, really has an added value. Paul Volcker one of my favorites, once said that the last financial innovation that actually added value to society was the ATM machine. I said that in 08 before Bitcoin. But anyway, the point is a whole bunch of what the financial industry does is, is one way or another, it's nibbling the public to death by a duck. It's taking little fractions, it's front run, high frequency trading is just nuclear powered front running of your orders into the marketplace. It's, it adds no value to society. Well, all that gets eliminated. You can't in in the blockchain. You don't have people buying and selling froth property rights. It's all real property rights attached to real stuff. So yeah, I think that it suffocates. And if we who doubt the financial system are correct, and the financial system is seventy five percent corrupt, then it's going to it's going to suffocate seventy five percent of the oxygen for the financial system. If we're incorrect, and if the financial system is is run by a bunch of saints, and it's only say one percent corrupt, then we'll just be taking one percent of the oxygen out of their air. And you know, my, I, I'm, I know which side I'm going to bet on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Dale has a follow-up to uh, Jeffrey's question. Uh, oil. What are what are your thoughts on the price of oil dropping? Well, I think, A, it's Saudi Arabia has decided to step up and be a regional hegemon. The United States isn't doing the business, it's doing the job anymore. Uh, of course, it is our president's great strategic play has been to pivot from, the U.S. has had an alliance with the Sunnis since the 1930s. We sent, Roosevelt sent an admiral over the 1930s. We've had an alliance with Sudi, Sunni uh, Arab world, and the Saudis in particular, since then. We keep them in power, keep their their royal family in power, and they keep the oil flowing. Uh, President Obama's strategic decision has been to shift away from them to the Persians, to the dreaded Persians, uh, and, the, and the Shia. And that's, that is opening World War III. 
because uh, the Sunnis are not standing for that. So I, I think we're, I think we're, it's kind of a foregone conclusion. This is uh, anyway. That that's the big pivot. Saudi Arabia is really sort of getting out of uh, the U.S. orbit, and they're taking care of business. They're smacking down Iran and Russia. Iran, R Russia's government budget, half of it comes from oil revenues, and it assumes a hundred dollar a barrel price. So this is part. This is partially Saudi Arabia just. Uh, taking care of business and stepping up outside of the U.S. orbit. A, that's one read. Another read I have on it is it's kind of a futures contract on, it's reflecting future expectations or expectations about the future economic growth. See, again, I just don't believe the numbers that, first, they show a five, you know, we printed a 5% growth number last quarter. I don't believe that. It's for so there are so many other signs that say there's not really an economic recovery going on, uh, and so they can do different things to prop up those numbers. But maybe what's happening is the world is getting. We never got out of the 08 crisis. In fact, the 08 crisis was the amuse bouche. The 08 crisis was nothing, uh, and all we've really done since is it's like we have a root. We're, we're doing. We need a root canal, and we're just having. Our dentists are just giving us more Novocaine, more and more and more Novocaine, QE, different forms of QE. Uh, if that theory is correct, and it's kind of associated with the Austrians, like the Austrian economists, uh, if that theory is correct, it's all going to crumble. And at some level, the world understands that, uh, that there isn't a real recovery, and what's going on with the price of oil is a uh, reflection of those future expectations about the economy. But I think it's primarily. I think it's, I'd have to look at this closer. I think it's primarily Saudi Arabia deciding to give a, a shiv to Iran and Russia. And I don't think it's some, some people suspect it's some secret, brilliant geopolitical chess move out of Washington. I don't think that at all. I think the, Sau the Saudis have, have, uh, have gotten tired of waiting around for that. Well, they understand that you can't, the U.S. isn't going to take care of business like we once did. And not to say, I mean, we've certainly got ourselves in, in a lot of trouble, but we're going to see regional hegemons spring up like that. And maybe that, maybe a, le a less decentralized world, uh, well, well, I don't want to, I, I kind of wish the, the uh, I won't go into it. Um, but I think that's what's going on with the price of oil. All right, and you can really see the the lack of recovery. I think a lot of your average people, know, a lot of your working class people, can see that. Despite how they try to manipulate things, it's like, oh, look at this recovery. People know. I, I think people are smart enough. People are feeling the squeeze on their finances. I, you know, I know I definitely am. A lot of the people I've talked to are definitely, uh, you know, they're not seeing any kind of uh, advancements in their own, you know personal things, and a lot of people are just running out of money, it seems like. It's very hard these, to hide. These youngsters, I, I don't mean to be rude, but I assume you're in your 20s, you look like you're in your early 20s or something, probably fresh out of college, and I hear that this whole generation, you read about them, who, you know, they're, they're 27 and they're living with their parents and still trying to get a first job. It's a, a horrible compared to my generation, a generation ago. You, Everyone got out of college and there were five job offers. It was... Uh, it was just a different world, and yeah, the 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 labor participation. You can't look at the unemployment rate. There's so many ways to game that labor participation rate. Is it a is hovering at a 30, 35 year low? The uh, you know they said we grew five percent last quarter, but nominally we grew six percent, and there was one percent inflation, so it was really five percent growth. Well, come on, does anyone believe there's one percent inflation? It's uh, you know on issue after issue, it just looks like they are gaining numbers to make things look just like a bad company CEO does. They're always trying to make their numbers look better than they are. That what the federal government is doing is trying to talk up its book. You know, it, it, to some degree, the whole financial system is a confidence game because it is so fractional. It's a confidence game. And that means the more that it actually manipulating the confidence of people starts being a real economic factor. Right, and it's kind of interesting. I think one of the only thing that's helped, things that's helped me kind of stay financially, you know, 
above water, I guess you could say, is dropping out of college. I I wasn't able to afford to continue my college education. I was an English major at the time, and I was, you know, looking at the cost of college. I had to, you know, I've been working since you know very young age and providing for myself, and it was this impossible thing to fathom. And then I find out about you know, things like the college bubble, and you know, all of these problems with with that too. And I think my generation has really kind of been dealt a bad hand when it comes to college. You know, unless you were able to maybe get in a STEM field or something like that or, you know, work in, you know, maybe like a com computer science field, I think there's a lot more opportunities for young people. But a lot of us have kind of just felt, you know, kind of been underneath the wheel, grinded, grinded down because it's very difficult to first afford college and then if you can make it through, paying off the student loans. Oh, my gosh. It's, that's such a bubble. I mean, that's – and I feel so bad for you folks. This is what happened. I used to live in China 30 years ago. I lived in the communist China back when it was communist for a year. And I saw central planning. And it's ridiculous. When you have central government manipulating all these prices, you get booms and busts. You get people over-investing in, in something. And you know, over in, one of the reasons your, your college loans are so high is because there is the college, the, the loan programs, which have let colleges have, in, have raised their prices so much faster than inflation. So you, so people come out of college with saddled with huge debt for having learned stuff that doesn't really add to their marketable skills. It's a, it's the kind you just get all these distortions in the marketplace when you get government bureaucrats setting prices, which is what basically we have. Yeah, well, there are there's good news in this, and that is we've been opened up to a world that allows us to self-educate and, you know, build skills, learning, you know, you can learn so many different programming languages for free now, taking online courses, so I think there, and I think our generation is technologically savvy enough to know about these things and really engage them, so I, I hope to see more of that, you know, I, I hope that there is some kind of way that we can use this new technology, including blockchain technology to our advantage. Yeah. So. Oh, there's so many ways. Can I give you a killer app that I don't know, it doesn't say, it's not at the forefront of what people are working on. I mean, it's such a big idea. I, some days I want to quit Overstock and quit, quit the other crypto projects. And just, you want to change the world? Can I tell your viewers who's going to change the world? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. A little bit of philosophy and economics background. There's a guy named Hernando de Soto. He's a Peruvian economist. Been arguing for a few decades. Wrote a book called *The Mystery of Capital*. Do you know that by any chance? *Mystery of Capital*. I've heard of that, but I, I have yet to read it. His argument is that capital is de is dead around the world because there are not good land titling systems. And if you're in Haiti and you've been living for generations on some little plot of land, or you're in Brazil in a favela, and your family may have been there for five generations but you can't get title to that piece. It may take you 30 years and hundreds of steps, which means hundreds of bribes, to get title to that place your great-grandfather settled. So because there isn't a good land titling thing, system, two things happen. There's not a reason to invest and develop that piece of land because you don't know if the local generalissimo shows up next month and says, oh, senor, no, you know, that was my land. And secondly, you can't get a bank to loan against it because no bank can loan against that land, no matter how many generations of your family have lived there, if there's not good legal title to it. Well, so Hernando de Soto has tried for decades to get countries to set up, uh, and his problem has been he's not had enough adoption. He's had some little experimental projects, but they've done, he tries, his point is if you could have land titling, good land titling, it would free up far more capital than could ever be delivered by the West in hundreds of years. The West could never give it as much an aid as could be just freed out, out of the land if you had had good land titling system. Well, somebody is going to develop a crypto land titling system, and that's going to change world history. Because once you have that, and then it doesn't even have to spread by decree. It can just spread by, somebody could build it. And people pay enormous amounts for the rights to run land titling. I just saw, I think it was in Ottawa, there's a company up there that bought the rights just to run the system for like six years. They paid a billion dollars for the rights. Because every time someone goes and looks up who owns a piece of land, they charge 700 bucks. Every time you want to transfer a title, 1200 bucks. It's an enormous place to extract rent to run that system. 
Well, so suppose a company came along and came up with a blockchain-based land titling system that counties, county by county around the country and around the world, people could just adopt, adopt into. They would save so much money would be squeezed out of the system. And you would have overnight, or you could have overnight or in a small number of years, that 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 world that this Hernando de Soto has been dreaming of for decades. And it would free if you did that, it would free up. If some company does that, not only is it going to ch save you know these billions in terms of all the costs associated with maintaining those county-run systems now, but it's going to have it's it would change the the opportunities of development around the globe just immediately. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look into that. Thank you for that. I know you've mentioned him before in some of your other talks, so I'm definitely going to look into that book. So thank you very well, much. Well, by the way, I do have to say the guy I've mentioned in my talks is is usually been Jesus Huerto de Soto, who's a Spanish economist of the same last name. This is Fernando de Soto from Peru. Oh, okay, okay. I thought, okay, I thought, uh, my mistake. Different, Sorry about that. Thanks for that correction. <laughs> I got a good question from Connie Gallippi. Hey, Connie. Uh, she's she's curious about the plans for investing the 4% of Bitcoin sales into furthering Bitcoin adoption worldwide, and what are your thoughts on supporting the onboarding of charities and nonprofits worldwide? Well, we, uh, we're not investing that 4%. We're donating it. We're donating it to organizations around the world and we're going to keep we're going to keep looking at new ones but as people spend on overstock in bitcoin 4% we are in touch with various charities and we're just giving that money to them and it's really just to further the cause of crypto okay awesome have another one from tim and then i won't keep you too much longer here we Actually, are, I, I was now. just i was just trying to type you a message not not doing so well saying i'll keep going if you do but if you want to get off we'll get off i've i've screwed up my schedule all right, thank you. Awesome. All right, well, we'll take another question from Tim Fry. A month ago, Wall Street Journal ran a front page article about banks asking large firms to move out stockpiles of cash or face fees. Banks don't want cash reserves to loan, and companies aren't investing money back into the system. What do you make of this? That's interesting. Can you stand by just a moment? I have to talk to my assistant. This will just take a second. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm my my handler here has uh, been up freeing up my schedule. Uh, so the the question was banks for not wanting to keep corporations to keep their cash reserves with them. What, say that again. Right. So a month ago, Wall Street Journal ran a front page article about banks asking large firms to move out stockpiles of cash or face fees. Banks don't want cash reserves to loan, and companies aren't investing money back into the system. What do you make of this? Well, I make the system is vapor locked. The system is vapor locked. In a healthy system, you would have people saving capital, people borrowing capital to go and achieve new projects. The intermediary, the bank, is always balancing the price of one and the price of another, usually probably a 300 basis point spread <coughs> for them to pay their fees and take a profit. And these prices, both of what the bank would be willing to pay the saver and what borrowers would be willing to pay the bank, would reflect actual <coughs> scarcity and value. They would reflect you know, how much possibility of their, their investment was there and things like that. All that's just been stepped on. It's all been just squelched by the government. What you have is government mandarins deciding, you know, what to set, what to set those prices at, really the bottom price, what to set it at, and because they think they're, that they're achieving some economic effect. Argument: The Austrians would say you're just building, building on sand. You're building on quicksand when you do that. So. Uh, uh, that's what I think what's, is what's, what's happening there. I mean, I, meanwhile, what, what, how the banks have been making money since the Great Recession, which we have not come out of, is uh, they've been you know, borrowing from the federal government at zero and loaning it back to the federal government at two. And it's just been, they've known since 2008, our banking system was kaput. But they did not, we did just what Japan did 24 years ago, didn't have the guts to stand up to the powerful domestic parties that needed to be taken on. And instead, we came up with this arrangement that's just, they've got huge potholes in their balance sheet. And 
instead of facing the music, facing them to face it, forcing them to face the music, we created a system that we could just, they could make free money and fill in their balance sheets and they don't even have to find businesses to loan to. They don't want to loan to business. Yeah, I mean that, that tells you, that story tells you what an oligarchy we are. We have an oligarchy that is so fixed to nursing on the public sugar tea that it doesn't even need customers anymore. The banking system doesn't even need customers. <laughs> you can just sit there and nurse off off the government, which is effectively your your my credit card. That's, and you that's see nice. them, yeah. And you, I'm sorry. And uh, you see them charge uh, fees and stuff for depositing large amounts of cash and all of these other fees for all of these other services, you know, that they provide. And it's you know, it's it's no question, you know, why people are choosing to be unbanked now. So there's this thing, you know, how can Bitcoin help the unbanked is a question that I hear a lot. And a lot of people don't realize that many people are voluntarily unbanked because they don't want to deal with the banks uh, and, and, you know, the fees and this kind of uh, corrupt behavior. Uh, well, crypto, I mean, that's the virtue of crypto. It lets you withdraw your wealth, your money, from institutions you don't trust. I mean, who wants? I'm, I I still have respect for the regional bankers in the U.S. and of the big banks. Actually, I I uh, oh, there's one or two I have some respect for who have not been as caught up in the shenanigans as everybody else. But who would want to keep their money with HSBC or Goldman Sachs? You or or even do not? You can't keep your money with Goldman Sachs. But even involve? I don't want to be involved in any business. I don't want to be involved in any business that has to do with the Genovese family. I don't want to be involved in any business that has to do with Russian organized crime. Similarly, I don't want to be involved in anything that has to do with Goldman Sachs. They are, or a number of the other parties. You've heard that they're pre they are predating. They are predators. They're predating on our republic. Absolutely. And uh, Connie Gallippi has a good question. What are your thoughts on the potential and the future of integrating Bitcoin or crypto into the world stock market, and generally how crypto can help in the developing and third world countries and the unbanked and underbanked? Well, a huge, the biggest thing is the land titling system. I just, I hope there's some PhD graduate student out there who get, I did some research a couple months ago trying to find any company working on this and nobody's really, you know, there are people who are at very preliminary stages saying we're building technology and it's going to do a hundred different things and one of the hundred things is the land titling. I swear there's this global, global opportunity to go and build the crypto land titling system and bring it to the public. Uh, that's, number one. And that's how you generate the, that's how you open up the capital, you unfreeze global capital. That would make, well, Fernando de Soto says that would make far, far, 50 times the difference that all, than all the capital that's ever been transferred from the West to the developing countries since World War II. It would be dwarfed by the amount of capital that could be freed up with good land titling. Then you have to say, okay, how do you, what's the system that marries that capital to human capital, and the system that marries financial capital with human capital in our country is called Wall Street. It, it just is a capital market, a capital market. That's its value. It marries financial capital to human capital. Well, we're we're working on that layer. At Overstock, we've got this project that we've been public about, Medici, what you and I were just talking about, and that's what it does. It's that second layer. It would be a crypto-based capital market. And then the third question is, how do you get human capital? How do you build human capital? I have a solution for the U.S. I'm not global, but we should switch to a voucher system. Our education system should be voucher-based. And so you have a market, and people can take their vouchers from the government and go and buy a private education. You get much, you'd save the government a ton of money, and you'd get a much better quality of education. So those are sort of, well, crypto doesn't have anything to do with the third layer, but those first two layers are sort of the central questions or two of the central questions of civilization can be radically overhauled through a crypto approach. That is why I'm convinced, I was, a, unlike Al Gore, I wasn't around quite at the beginning of the internet, but I was around in 1999, and we all knew that we were doing something in the internet in 1999 that was going to be as revolutionary as the Gutenberg Bible. But crypto, for those, the, those two layers I just described, instead now have centralized government control institutions. So the political, implication, the political implications of crypto, I think, are going to go deeper than the internet does. I think it's going to change, you know, society, the liberal society for 500 years has evolved down this one path. 
And I think that this lets us sort of revisit some decisions that are 500 years old and take a different path. Yeah, I would like to see specialization, especially in the land title uh, project that you mentioned, because what I have seen as far as uh, or organizations wanting to expand the use of crypto is they're wanting to take on too many different things at one time, and I'd like to see a little more specialization and you know focusing on getting one thing right instead of trying to do everything. Um, and Connie, she she was referring to just to follow up on that last one. I was referring to his world stock fair trade market that Overstock started to support artisans around the world. So, um, so yeah, with the last question about uh, the world stock market, she was talking about the world stock fair trade market. Ah, um, uh, well, oh, the world. I got it. I thought you meant the world, the world stock market. Well, too, it, yeah. may, it may help us start paying suppliers uh, differently and saving them a few percent and in fees. Just paying people in the developing world is there are amazing friction costs in the banking system that get eliminated through crypto. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting. Uh, another one from Dale. Uh, she asks, "Was the approach Iceland dealt with their crisis the right way to deal with the banking system? What would happen if the rest of the world followed suit?" You mean throwing bankers in jail? Yes. Yeah, I don't think it goes far enough. I would, I would actually, it, I would hang. I would introduce hanging. I have nothing against capital punishment. Don't think it needs to be. Uh, I think when there are people like who have done the massive anti-social fraud uh, that has been committed on the public, by which I include guys like Bernie Madoff, but I also include J.P. Morgan. I mean, have they paid 13 billion dollars in fines now? Uh, J.P. Morgan, who's a Jamie Dimon. You know, set up some gallows down at Wall Street and Broad and start hanging the really egregious offenders. Uh, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying this for hyperbole. I'd start with hanging. Uh, set, and you know, not willy nilly, not like the mullahs in Tehran. But there's no reason we couldn't have federal laws against fraud that was so systemic and so, uh, so antisocial on you know multi-billion. You know, somewhere in America, there are millions of grandmas who should be enjoying the golden years who are working somewhere with a paper hat on their head, you know, because some schmuck on Wall Street ripped off their savings. And you do that to a few thousand people. I don't have any philosophical, or millions of people, I don't have a philosophical problem with hanging such a person as I wouldn't if somebody had actually used, held up a million grandmas at night. Yeah, I mean, I, I can agree with that. I, I bought um, my boss, Tim, this mug that says politicians on it, and there's a little hanging politician off of the O, but I think we need one for bankers, too. Uh, and, you know, regardless of whether, this, uh, I think we can probably both agree that you're not going to see the state do that. You're not going to see the state institute a death penalty on these people. But what you are seeing in dark markets, and this is an unpopular side of dark markets, is you're probably going to see things like assassination markets emerging. Uh, there's a, there's already even uh, a, a dark market site that uh, has bounties, different crypto bounties on some of these people already, some of these bankers and uh, you know politicians who who are committing fraud and ripping ripping you know off the life savings of millions of people. Well, so. I'm against I'm against that. I think that there is a role for the state. You said to the opening, the role of the state is to prevent force and fraud. Oh, you said to prevent fraud. It's actually, I would go farther. It's even a even a true libertarian, an Ayn Randian libertarian, I think, would say the state can prevent force, uh, force and fraud. And then the difference between a libertarian and a classical liberal is that a li classical liberal, such as Milton Friedman or myself, says, well, in addition, the state can have a role to provide to cure mar true market failures, to break up monopolies where they exist, to uh, to do some regulation, and there are, there are things, cases where the market fails, and you want uh, there are collective action problems, and you want a government that can sort of bridge, that can get us over. So, so that a classical liberal sees a role for a somewhat larger uh, state than a true libertarian, but and that would include, in my view, you don't want private citizens putting bounties on and being able to get away with. You know, putting bounties on on people. I think that we can't. A, a world where much of that's going on is a is a world where there's not going to be social order for long. However, I, I would be. I have no philosophical objection to the state 
saying capital punishment could be extended to sort of the kinds of severe financial crimes which have endangered our republic. In fact, I think it's just self-preservation at this point. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I definitely am not a you know I'm not a supporter of assassination markets, but I do see them as a response to the state's inaction uh, to pursue justice um, in a lot of cases, and it's an unfortunate side effect of a state that is not upholding what what a classic liberal or a libertarian believes the state's function should be. Um, it's it's definitely an unfortunate side effect of that. So. Yeah, well, there, there have been corrupt officials for a millennia. We, we don't want to go around, well, once you get to the point where you're assassinated, and then you have a revolution. And I'd love, I'd love to see if there is a revolution coming. If if, I think there is a constitutional moment coming, because we are living in a Ponzi scheme. This is a big Ponzi scheme. What your experience is, there is a Ponzi scheme, and there is, as Peter, Sch what you guys Peter Schiff says, there's no way to taper a Ponzi scheme. All this stuff about tapering and... There's no way to taper a Ponzi scheme. So I don't see really a way out of this cul-de-sac. Um, and I think when it cracks, when we have a 2008 or worse, maybe a 1932 or worse, there's going to be a lot of people who, there's going to be a, a, a constitutional moment. And uh, I hope I don't see that term. There's a lot of, I, I'm certainly concerned. I, I'm concerned that the government's concerned. We go online to see the government's like preparing for a civil war, and I will do everything I can to keep that from being violent. It's nothing good happens when you have protesters throwing rocks at the National Guard. Nothing good happens from that. Right, and uh, so Tim says plus one on hang the bankers. <laughs> so. <laughs> So uh, we'll take one more question uh, from Dale, and then uh, I'm going to read a little bit, and we'll do final thoughts and stuff. Uh, so. She's asking you about your opinion on Apple Pay and how it will impact crypto. So yeah, so Apple Pay and even you know Google Wallet, they're coming out with these easier to use uh, wallets and payment systems. Do you see those as a threat? Well, they they uh, and they don't include. Uh, they're not. Apple isn't integrated with crypto, right? Doesn't let you use Bitcoin. No. Uh, well, they. Uh, it does. One of the advantages of Bitcoin is the you know the convenience. And if you can get the same convenience through Apple Pay, then it's going to bite into the comparative advantage of, of Bitcoin. Uh, you're still going to have the transaction fees though of two or three percent, aren't you? If you go through, because when you're using Apple Pay, it's just hooked up to a credit card, right? I believe so. Yeah, I believe the transaction fees are still much higher than using Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, it may be hooked up direct. May, Anyway, my guess is there's still two or three percent transaction fees, which, you know, the average, the net margin of a typical small business is like three percent. So if they can save three percent on their expenses, they double their profitability. So crypto is still going to look attractive to them. Mm -hmm. And it is still better than if you were trying to transfer money from someone else. It's still better than something like Western Union that still has a stronghold on remittances. Um, but it's still not as good as crypto as far as uh, transfer fees and stuff. But there is an infrastructure problem uh, still, you know, that's still being developed and getting people on board with, uh, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain technology is still, I think it's still a ways off. I think they have maybe more important things to worry about at the moment, but I do hope to see more development in that area. Yeah, I actually was in, I spent Christmas in Australia learning to surf, or learning to paddle nice. a surfboard is I guess another way I'd say it. And, <laughs> yeah, and I had to have some money Western Union to me, because my credit card I hadn't uh, set up right. And I couldn't believe the both the hassle of it and the fees, and I think that with our, uh, I forget what the percent was, but I, I understand that if you're wiring money back to Pakistan or Africa, you're taking your 50 to 30 percent vig is what comes off the top for Western Union to transfer the money. That's just crazy. It really is. It really is. So I I definitely look forward to Western Union uh, being. Uh, you know, overthrown, I guess you could say. Um, so I do kind of want to end with a quote, and I know you're a minarchist, and I, I actually, I, I can definitely understand minarchy, and I, and I do support it, and I, I think there are a lot of really great arguments. Did for I it. ever, I, I, I was an anarchist? Minarchist. 
minarchist. You believe in That's limited minimal... government. Hmm, I haven't heard that term. I like it. A minarchist. I'm there. Right, right, and and I I respect minarchy. I I think it's something that I I'm an anarchist myself, but it's more of like a personal anarchy. Again, it's something that I I wouldn't want to put on other people. And there are definite strong arguments for minarchy, and and even you know regulation too. I I think regulation, looking at it in terms of practicality, this is an inevitability that we're going to see. So I think one can be against something philosophically but understand that, you know, regulation is coming whether or not, you know, you're opposed to it. So But we would say as Wall Street on Wall Street they'd say I would say you're directionally correct. If you want to go to anarchy, you're directionally correct and you think I'm directionally direct correct from where we are, which is too big a state. Yeah. So I wanted to read something uh, from the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Uh, the state will, of course, try to slow or halt the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns, use of technology by drug dealers and tax evaders, and fears of societal disintegration. Many of these concerns will be valid. Crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to trade freely and will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded. An anonymous computerized market will even make possible abhorrent markets for assassinations and extortion. Various criminal and foreign elements will be active users of CryptoNet, but this will not halt the spread of crypto anarchy. Just as the technology of printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds and the social power structure, so too with, will cryptologic tools fundamentally alter the nature of corporations and of government interference in economic transactions. What are your thoughts on that? Inshallah. From her lips to God's ears, or as, as uh, inshallah. Uh, that's that's my dream, of course. I I think what's happened is the central institutions we've set up. You know, there's all kinds of problems. I mean, they get captured, they become costly because they're bureaucratic. But it's really just their nature to want more power, to grow and grow. And we set them up with all these constitutional checks to see that didn't happen. But I think if if Jefferson were back today, he'd look at what we have and said, yeah, that's about what I thought would happen. Uh, and What's great is these changes. All our lives, we of the minimal state school have been remonstrating with people and trying to convince people and such. With this technology, we don't need to convince anybody anymore. It's not about changing minds. It's, about, it's just about doing it. It's just about it taking part. And more of us who take part, the more robust this system becomes. You know, we get to vote with our we get to vote with our iPhone. We get to vote with the, you know, the way we accept our paycheck. Uh, the more robust it becomes, we win, but without having to, to, you know, to talk to any politicians who are getting paid off by the opponents of, of freedom on the other side. Absolutely. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? Mm. Fight the man. Hang in there. I think the next 10 years is going to be more exciting than the internet even got. This is so, I'm, I'm talking to people all through the crypto movement all the time, and different companies and such, and I see what people are working on, and every week I hear about something that I just want to quit my job and say, that's so, that's, a, you know, it's not curing cancer. Something like that, but short of that, I mean, a job, a work where you can build something, and it's going to have such a dramatic political effect. Uh, when you think of how much of our political institutions have become these central, you know, central institutions we don't trust anymore, and how they can all be disintermediated just as clearly as the buggy whip industry was. It's such an exciting time to be alive, and uh, I think there may be, you know, some, some bruised skin knees along the way, but uh, it's an exciting time to be alive. And you just want to briefly mention, since you since you mentioned cancer, Project Maryland is a is a project by my friend Isaac Yanomoto, who is working on an open source cure for cancer. And he actually was taking Bitcoin for funding. He had an Indiegogo campaign, and uh, he was actually taking it for funding. So it, it's the most exciting time to live in, I think. And I'm really, I, I think this is we're right at the beginning of it, and it's only going to get better from here. So I'm very excited. And thanks so much again for talking with me. It's always a pleasure. And we could talk about this stuff for hours. You know, it's, it's uh, always a great discussion. We ought to catch up about once a quarter. If we do that over the next two or three years, I think our little interviews will be a nice time capsule of what was understood and, and seen as it, as it developed. 
I definitely agree and look forward to doing that again. I'll definitely be having you on more. So uh, let's see, I do want to say uh, next the next episode of Crypto Combos is going to feature Brian Sovereign of Sovereign Tech and that will air January 28th. I'll probably be doing about two episodes a month now and I'll definitely be having Patrick on again and I thank everyone for watching and until next time, keep calm and encrypt on. And